everyone, joining us today is um, Lydia Zopi, a PhD student of Mechanical Engineering at John Hopkins University with a specialization in medical robotics. Uh, Dr. Zopi, would you like to tell us a bit more about your background and research? Yes, absolutely. I am not a doctor yet. Um, you know, just a little tiny correction. Don't want to take titles that I did not earn at the moment. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Karthik, and also Shonak, thank you for having me. Um, let me make sure that I can share my screen. All right. So, do you see the presentation or? Yeah. yeah you... Okay. So, whatever I'm seeing, like the presenter mode, right? Okay. Perfect. Cool. Um, so, yep. As I was introduced, my name is Lydia. I am a doctorate student. Um, so, did not complete my education yet. Um, fourth year, which means I'm very, very close to graduating. Um, I should be done in about one and a half to two years maximum. Um, I don't know. I want to talk about the pets first. I have pets. Um, I got my potato cat. I got a jerk bird, um, which is called Coco Alexander. That's his full name. And then uh, my kitty is called Fifi. And uh, if you're wondering, um, they get along super well together. Sometimes he likes to sleep on her back, um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, but they're they're good friends, and I love them so much. And I don't know if you actually get to see my cat behind me. Yeah, she's she's right over there. She's she's very curious as to what's going on. Um, so I was born in Riga in Latvia. Um, I lived in Russia for a little bit because my mom is Russian, and then I lived in Lebanon uh, for the most conscious part of my life because my dad is Lebanese. Um, and so both of my parents right now um, are residing in Lebanon. Um, for my education, I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering at um, the American University of Beirut. Um, big shout out to AUB. I think it's a really amazing institution. Like it was really formative in my career and just great, amazing people and research opportunities. I um, did my focus in um, robotics and controls um, during my last year of undergrad. And then I came to University of Maryland, where I continued uh, working on my master's degree, um, which again was in mechanical engineering. That was in College Park. Um, and then lastly, I ended up doing my P. I ended up starting my PhD at University of Maryland with my current advisor, Axel Krieger. Um, but then he applied to Hopkins, and he got accepted there. So we all, the whole lab transferred with him in 2019. Um, so I'm still working on. Um, my PhD is still in mechanical engineering, although I do a lot of CS work um, and the focus is in medical robotics, um, which essentially involves a whole lot of different things like design, manufacturing, um, software development, image guidance, motion planning, all the fancy schmancy terms that people like to hear. Uh, but if you actually put them in an intelligent system, they end up doing um, pretty cool things. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, my advisor is Axel Krieger. Um, check out his latest work, which is not too, too latest at this moment, but he published it this year in Science Robotics, which is a really good journal. Um, and um, it's called Autonomous Robotic Laparoscopic Surgery for Intestinal Anastomosis. Uh, what you got to get from this is that a robot can autonomously suture two intestines together without the doctor's intervention um, and at a quality that would match the surgeon's work. So it's really cool. Um, outside of research, I love doing a lot of different things. I enjoy snowboarding a lot, and we do have some mountains over here. I'm a big baseball fan. Um, you know, I'm supporting the Yankees. I think they're playing today. I got to check on that. Um, I love socializing and going out bookstores. I always look for you know fun bookstores, especially if they have brunch places around them. Um, and then food, obviously, who doesn't like food? But yeah, I always am on the lookout for new places that are opening up in the area. Um, just for context, Hopkins is in Baltimore, um, Maryland. Um, Baltimore is not the capital of Maryland. Annapolis is the capital of Maryland, but Baltimore is a city. Um, it's, a, it's a nice place to be in. I do enjoy it. And I guess I can talk a little bit about the trauma work that got me invited to this talk. Um, so I'll start by giving you a bit of an overview and provide the motivation, um, you know, for the work that I do. Um, up to 29% of the pre-hospital trauma deaths are potentially survivable and were attributed to uncontrolled hemorrhage. So an uncontrolled hemorrhage is essentially an internal bleeding um, that occurs and when it's uncontrolled that means it's 
it was not stopped at the right time. Um, so you can see on the picture at the bottom left, um, you know, when people get into accidents um, in a military setting, gunshots, blast wounds, um, the first thing that happens is that the patient needs to get to the emergency room where the doctor will perform something called a fast scan, which is essentially um, a technique for collecting ultrasound images at certain locations to um, assess basically the patient's need and figure out how bad the internal bleeding is. So if that happens at a late period of time, the patient is just simply gonna die because you need to control the hemorrhage as soon as possible. And the reason why you know it often happens is because you know it takes time to get to the hospital in certain circumstances. The US is pretty big. And the other part is that there are certain areas where you just simply do not have the required professional skill um, or even the needed surgeons to be able um, to be there on site um, at the accident location and then help the patients there. Um, so all in all, there's clearly a need um, for using a robotic solution that will essentially allow the doctors to mitigate all of these drawbacks of having to transport the patient over an extended period of time to get to the hospital and then performing um, you know, any interventional procedures if needed. So what we are trying to do is that because we don't have a physician on the ambulance, um, we are trying to put an on-site robot, um, which could be inside of an ambulance or in the overall um, war zone, for example. And then the robot, there are two parts to it. The robot could, so as I mentioned, the first thing that the doctor would do when they get a patient um, with trauma, they would use the fast scan procedure, which is collecting ultrasound images. And after that, they figure out how bad the situation is to essentially figure out what they want to do next. Um, so we want to assist the doctor and potentially um, put a robot on site to perform these ultrasound scans. Um, so that, you know, we do not really rely on their direct presence um, in critical situations. And so this is essentially the motivation for incorporating more robots in ambulance visit locations or um, other war areas, for example, or even in space. Um, and then have the robot assist the surgeon or perform completely autonomously the ultrasound scans. So the way this originally started and that is work that was completed by my colleagues um, so they're um, mentioned the papers are at the bottom of the page if you want to read up more about it and then know more about the people but they essentially um, developed something called a teleoperated solution and a teleoperated solution means that the doctor would be present in the hospital um, controlling the robot on an ambulance um, and then seeing the images in the hospital itself. So the doctor does not necessarily need to be present in the ambulance anymore. Um, they just control the robot remotely um, to be able to assess how critical the situation of the patient is because even those things take time when, by the time the patient gets to the hospital. And you really, whatever time you can save, um, that's gonna be really great. Um, so you can see like a sort of an overview of um, the different parts of the system that go in there. Um, so there is the, there's the robot itself and then on the robot we have something called RGBT camera, which is essentially a regular camera where you can see the patient, but it also gives you a depth information. So you can do a 3D reconstruction of the patient through that camera. And then um, they had an algorithm that will allow you to detect different landmarks on the patient body um, and then classify certain um, regions of interest, for example, wounds or the umbilicus, and then use all of that information to autonomously propose different scanning locations on the body. Um, and so the way that goes is after we get those regions for the proposal regions um, labeled one, two, three, four on the little phantom that you see, the robot will um, go to that general, that general location. And then the doctor will essentially take control of the robot. There's a little system over here. So this is the doctor and he's holding, um, he's holding something called the phantom omni which essentially is a device that looks literally like a pen 
and then he can control that pen and then the robot and the robot's tip is going to move um, according to the position of that pen that he's holding. So once the robot goes to the overall regions on the torso of the patient, the doctor will then take control of that pen and then drive the robot onto different locations um, and then look at the ultrasound images and try to process them and figure out how critical the patient's condition is. On the right, you see a more like an up-close view of the system um, where we have the actual robot. Um, there's a camera that I just mentioned. Um, we have something called the force sensor, and that essentially allows to measure the forces that are applied on the ultrasound probe to make sure that A, we are actually in contact with the patient, and B, we're not exceeding the safe limits. Um, so that's the first step. And then we've also done, this is where I started joining in the project. We've done a little bit of work um, on some deep learning techniques for doing skin segmentation specifically for um, trauma cases. So you can see, for example, you have an abdomen here and then there are some wounds. Um, so the network will essentially segment out the skin from everything else. Um, that also include, includes avoiding some bandage locations um, and even drawing a contour around the wound um, to essentially make sure that we're only um, scanning because that was supposed to be extended into autonomous operation. So we want to make sure um, that we're scanning regions that are actually scannable. So we want to avoid putting the ultrasound probe inside of the wound that's going to cause infection. You do not want to image anything on the bandage. So you need to identify the regions um, where you can actually collect the images from. So we've done some work on that. And then um, my, um, I would say that's the most relevant part in my thesis, which is the autonomous operation of the robot. That happened during COVID time. So we shifted a little bit instead of um, just scanning um, the patient torso for trauma, we decided to perform some scans on the patient lung. And the reason why that's translatable is because parts of the lungs are actually, uh, imaging certain parts of the lung is kind of similar to imaging um, certain fast scan locations in a sense that these locations are obstructed by the rib cage. And the reason why that's important is because if you get an ultrasound probe and you want to visualize the heart, for example, so the heart, liver, spleen are the three biggest organs that need to be imaged in a fast scan. And because they're behind the rib cage, the ultrasound signal ends up being completely reflected off the bones. And so you really don't get a good image of the organs anymore. You want to avoid that. And the same concept applies for the lungs because the lungs are also contained within the rib cage. So we have essentially um, um, a little kind of like a methodology here. And, you know, it depends if we have um, prior CT scans of patients or if we don't have CT scans. If we do have CT scans and we want to do like maybe a longitudinal study and keep track of the patient's disease progression, the doctor would essentially select certain location, uh, locations that they want to image within the lung. And then we process that information with the CT scan um, and then direct the ultrasound. We run an algorithm to propose the uh, ultrasound location and orientation on the patient's body to be able to get those images of um, the elements that the doctor wants to see. Um, but if we do not have these prior CT scans, um, then we essentially use, um, we use a deep network to propose ribcage landmarks and essentially we use that to know that, hey, these are the regions that we want to avoid and we want we do not want to image because as I mentioned, all the ultrasound signal is gonna get reflected off. And then we propose four scanning locations that are standardized um, and lung imaging, especially after COVID, it's called POCUS. Um, and then we drive the robot to that location. Um, we collect um, ultrasound, we collect force displacement um, data which essentially means that we move the ultrasound probe along the patient's body, and then um, we use that information to figure out whether we're in between the ribs or on the rib. And again, we don't want to be on the rib because we can't see anything. We want to be in between the ribs. Um, and then we finally collect the ultrasound images. 
Um, this is more of an up-close view of the system, which is pretty similar to the previous one, but it's fully autonomous, so it is not operated by the doctor. We have the robot manipulator, um, again, the depth camera, which gives you the full point cloud, which is like a 3D representation of the patient. Um, the four-storic sensor, again, to make sure we're A in contact and B not exceeding forces, and a wireless ultrasound probe. And then we ran our experiments on the actual, on, a, on an ultrasound phantom um, that we created in the lab as well um, with some other people that helped me out with it. Um, this is more of a, you know, more of an overview of how we generate those landmarks. Um, this was in collaboration with Siemens and they provided us with a network that allows us to um, predict these little red dots that you see on the rib cage and that we interpolate between these red dots to sort of predict where the ribs would be located. And again, as I mentioned, this is to help us understand whether we're on the ribs or in between the ribs to make sure that we're not imaging anything, um, anything that's like a bone structure. Um, and then lastly, after we performed the autonomous, um, autonomous ultrasound data collection, even though that was for um, lungs, you can easily translate that to trauma. I unfortunately cannot show you the final system that we have because um, that paper is still not out yet. Um, so they, you know, I can't really show too much information, but we do, we're working on a system that essentially allows us to perform a therapeutic procedure to actually mitigate um, the internal hemorrhage, um, which is using this Reboa catheter um, that is inserted from a certain location um, from the femoral artery has to be specifically in between the inguinal ligament and then the bifurcation point. So we insert the needle here through which we insert a catheter that goes all the way to the main aorta. And then once we hit, hit a certain location, we inflate the balloon and that essentially controls the flow of blood and allows us to control the hemorrhage um, temporarily. Um, so that's currently work in progress. So stay tuned for any upcoming news on that. And I don't want to take up more time. Um, yeah, the thank you slide with the questions, if you have anything. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lydia Zubbi, for your presentation. Uh, we need to the questions now. Um, our first question is, what challenges did you face when dealing with your robot system? <laughs> uh, it depends on which phase of life I was in. Uh, my first robot system, I did not really I wasn't too prepared in dealing with an entire robotic system, to be honest, um, because it's not just about moving the robot. You have to make sure that all the different components that go into your robotic system work together perfectly. Um, you know, as you've seen, we have camera information coming in. We have force data, torque data. Um, you got to make sure that everything is processed in a um, timely manner, right? Like the frequency at which you're collecting the data, um, you want to make sure that you're filtering out some of your signals because they might be noisy. Um, so putting everything together um, is probably the biggest challenge in making an entire robotic system work. It's not as intelligent as humans. Um, so coming up with solutions that will allow the robotic system to work consistently takes up quite a bit of thought and effort. Have you ever tested your ultrasound robot on uh, real humans? Oh, absolutely not. We cannot do that. So the way it usually goes, um, you cannot do that unless you file something called an IRB. So any human studies require approval from the university. Um, and then the more interaction there is between the human and the robot, the stricter the safety rules are going to be. Um, it's just a very, very complicated process, which is why a lot of the studies are actually performed on animals before they're taken. Because when you want to perform them on humans, that's called a clinical trial. Um, and so for actual products um, to be able to get there out in the market, you need, you need the FDA approval. Um, it's a very complicated process. So we start off with animals. And then if the actual study permits, you could work with cadavers, but testing it on humans is depending on how invasive the system is, but it's usually, it's not that commonly performed in an academic setting. Have you, have you tried animals? I have not tried animals. 
I wanted to, um, but I was discouraged by the collaborator. He's a he's a doctor, he's a surgeon. He's like, that's not going to be the same. Um, it's a little bit tricky because we can't do studies on cadavers either um, because we work with a lot of blood. So like the, you know, the cadaver is pretty dried out. We can't, we can't do that. Um, but we are considering for certain procedures um, to conduct studies on pigs. Um, so a bit of a more general question here, but what inspired you to pursue a career related to mechanical engineering? That's a very good question. When I first started my undergrad, I actually did chemical engineering. For whatever reason, I was fascinated by the oil industry. And uh, after a year, I did not particularly enjoy that. It really didn't, it just didn't align with my interest too much. And honestly, I guess a lot of people would be, uh, I like physics, I like math. Mechanical engineering was probably the closest field um, that I um, would be interested in. And that's how I got into it. And then I got a final year project in my undergrad that's related to robotics. Um, and I was, I fell in love with it. I figured that this is what I want to do um, in my higher education. And that's what I stuck with. I stuck with medical robotics because I, I'm more interested in that than, you know, surveillance robotics or, I, I yeah, I'm not a huge fan of autonomous car driving. I, I like to work more on systems and I do believe that you know, this is the future, medical robotics. Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna boom at some point. Um, we already have a lot of robotically assisted surgeries, and even though autonomy is not gonna happen in the very near future, we're definitely paving the way for it to take over um, at some point. Um, yeah, I think our final question for you is um, just how can high schoolers get involved with robotics and medicine? That's a really good question. Um, first of all, we're in the technology era, right? So the first thing that I would do is just look things up. Um, I always recommend it to people, just look it up, see what's going on around you. Um, are there any potentially conferences that are you know, happening nearby? Um, the other thing is I've seen a lot of small scale competitions and larger scale competitions going on in different parts of the US. Um, I've heard of Bex Robotics and there's a few other organizations, at least in the area, um, where students are literally provided with robotic systems and then they form groups and then they compete um, to achieve a certain task um, with other students. And that's a really great way to start because it'll give you good hands-on experience. Um, and talk to people like me, um, you know, just keep talking to people. We personally, I have worked with a high school student. Um, her name is Avani and she was in high school um, when she co-authored the paper with me that was the autonomous long ultrasound. And she actually joined um, our research lab at Hopkins, um, which is Ax Axel's lab essentially. Um, she joined us to do research over the summer and that's how she got that exposure. So sometimes just reaching out to professors, um, it doesn't hurt, you know, the worst case scenario is that they're not going to respond to you. You know, if they feel like they don't want to invest in it, they'll be just ignoring their emails. But um, a lot of professors I know, including Axel, they actually do respond to students and we invite them over and they conduct research with us. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, the other thing is you might want to look out if your school does any collaboration with universities for programs like that. So that would be my recommendation. Got it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And also for the audience, well, thank you so much for watching our interview with Dr. Sophie. Take care and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>